Yep, we're back at it with another style study, but this one's a little different. So, I haven't been through formal art education, and because of all of that, all of my learning as an artist has been very hands-on. I've picked up skills along the way as and when I needed them, pretty much on the fly. So, when it comes to the old masters and Renaissance era art, I really had no idea about their work and their style until recently. I became obsessed with Renaissance era painting and like any normal YouTuber, I'm going to turn this obsession into a video for you guys. Now as with the previous style studies that I've done recently, this video will also be split into three parts. You'll have part one which is the analysis, but in part two, instead of doing a direct study of one of the paintings from the Renaissance era, I thought instead I would share with you some tips on how you can pretty much fake the Renaissance effect in any painting. Yeah, this is now a life hacks channel. Five minute crafts, you better step your game up. What am I saying? <laughs> As always, if you enjoyed this video, then give me a thumbs up, hit that subscribe button down below because you know there's going to be more of these and I've been so good about uploading every single week lately, so you have to give me something for that. Okay? Okay. And with all of that said, let us now jump into another style study featuring the old masters. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, I haven't actually had art history lessons. If you want to learn the theoretical art stuff behind Renaissance era art, I can promise you there are many other people on YouTube who actually know this stuff and will teach it to you a lot better. But here, I kind of want to treat this like any other style study and look at an overview of what we can learn from the work itself as opposed to the meaning behind it all. And what's the one thing we love on this channel? Say it with me now. Lists. So, here are four main characteristics of popular old-timey art. Okay, so I've just done a quick Google and as it turns out, the first digital painting was created somewhere in the 1960s. I mean, I would have guessed more 1990s, but okay, Mandela effects be like. <laughs> the point is, pretty much all art before this time, particularly art in the Renaissance era, was traditionally created. The most popular wet medium was oil paints and the go-to dry medium was generally charcoal. For the purposes of this video, we're gonna stick to oil paintings just because they are vibrantly colourful, unlike my closet. <laughs> The thing with traditional art though is that you can't really zoom in. It's pretty much impossible to get extremely tiny details and there's only so much smoothing you can achieve. So a lot of it is painterly, mostly due to the limitations of the medium. I'm sure if we put Michelangelo in front of a Cintiq, we'd be able to see every pore in God's face. So, because the traditional medium is fairly limited, it has led to a lot of old art being fairly painterly. In my opinion, this adds a ton of character, very hand of the artist-y. Another cool thing about oil paints is the satiny shine you can achieve. It's like with silk, it just catches the light in such a beautiful way that as far as I know, we simply cannot replicate exactly through the digital medium. We can totally fake the effect though, as we will see in part two. So we have painterly organic brush strokes and a satiny finish. Now, funnily enough, the first LED lights were also invented in the 1960s. Before this, there were pretty much only halogen lamps, which by the way, will damage your eyes to no end. Trust me, I used to be a stage performer. But going even further back, the only artificial light you could have in, say, the 1400s or so, would be oil lamps, possibly lanterns. 
<laughs> oh, that's hot. That's hot. These would be lit by fire, which always casts a warm glow. And as we know from basic color theory, if there is a warm light source, it creates cooler toned shadows. So in pretty much all art that was created in an indoor setting, the characters and objects would have a warm light source and cool toned shadows. Of course, this could change based on the artist's discretion, possibly also when it's an outdoor scene, but that warm fire glow really serves to push a painting back in time. Here, I kind of also want to talk about Rembrandt lighting. This is a very dramatic lighting setup where you place the light in front and to the side of the model. This casts a dramatic shadow on the skin and you can see like a triangle of light on the side of the face that is in shadow. This, as you may have guessed, was characteristic of the work of Dutch artist Rembrandt. And it is used to this day and is considered one of the most flattering lighting setups for portraits. But again, the reason it feels so classical is because Rembrandt lighting, to its core, requires just one source of light, ideally a warm one. Like if there were only one lantern present in the room. But in general, you'll find that a lot of old realistic paintings had a warm light and cool shadows. This is a tricky one for me to figure out because there are so many different types of art from the time of the old masters. So to keep us all from going insane, we're going to focus in on some of the popular portrait work because that's the kind of art that I make and understand best. If there is a character involved in a Renaissance painting, the rest of the composition is usually centered around the character. But when you look at these compositional elements, here's a couple of things you'll notice. First, pretty much all leading lines are created by the surrounding characters. So for instance, in this painting of The Last Supper, your focus is on Jesus in the middle because people are either looking at him or pointing to him. Here, the focus is on the surgery because everyone's looking at a literal cut open hand. <gasps> The other way in which they draw focus to the character is through the lighting. The central element, the main character in this case, is generally the only well-lit area of the painting. Everything around the main character, be it other people or furniture or architecture, is generally in the shadows. This is a trick I like to call framing. The shadows form a dark frame for the central object or character. Other framing elements include regular everyday objects such as crockery, furniture, drapery is a big one, and maybe even plants and flowers. Add a dark background and a single warm light source and there's the trick to a typical renaissance painting. I wanted to call this rendering but I think that would be too narrow a title. But let's now look at some of the typical artistic choices from the portraits in this era. First things first, a majority of these characters are, let's face it, Caucasian. Perhaps that is an effect of way less global migration, but it is true. And also these characters are generally very stereotypically masculine or feminine. Again, probably a sign of the times. The men have hard planes and muscles, usually a very blue steel expression. The men generally have a dark, mysterious vibe around them. The women, on the other hand, are all soft curves, very soft shadows, lots of drapery and supple skin. In general, the women have this light, airy, almost angelic appearance. Again, this isn't all art from the Renaissance era, but it is a popular trend. The other thing you'll notice is that there aren't usually hard shadows on the skin itself, particularly on the quote-unquote good characters. So the heroes, the deities, the angels, the morally good characters generally have very soft blending in the skin, particularly on the face. You will also notice that these characters are very youthful and have an idealistic body. 
The darker characters, though, have very harsh shadows. These are your morally corrupt, generally old, and physically not ideal, in quotations. Not my views, but just the narrative I'm picking up from the art itself. And unless the lighting is super dramatic, I've also noticed that there are generally no specular highlights on the skin. Which makes sense, because specular highlights usually only appear if the skin is sweaty or oily or is artificially highlighted with makeup. I'm gonna guess that no one back then wanted to look sweaty in their portraits, and a solid cheekbone highlight probably just wasn't a thing back then. Anastasia Beverly Hills is quaking. So, generally, there were no specular highlights on the skin itself. So, to sum up the analysis portion of this video, here are the four major characteristics of popular Renaissance paintings. Painterly brush strokes and a lot of character through the hand of the artist. Warm lighting and cool shadows and possibly even dramatic Rembrandt lighting. The central element is usually framed by its surroundings, either through actual surrounding elements or through light and shadow. The characters themselves are very idealistic with perfect skin, but no specular highlights or harsh shadows on the face. Alright, now this is the fun part. I had initially decided to do a study and an original, but there are so many old masters with so many different styles, I literally could not choose what to study. So instead, I had a cool idea. I'm going to take one of my own paintings and show you how to make it look super old timey, as if it's from the Renaissance era. This is the painting I chose. And I was able to break this process down into six steps, so let's go through them together. Remember how we talked about the only lighting being firelit? You can fake the effect by bumping up the yellow in the midtones and highlights, maybe even bump up the red a little bit. Here I'm using a color balance adjustment layer. You can go directly in with color balancing the original layer. I'm just doing this so you can see a before and after. And if you're feeling really adventurous, you can also go ahead and turn the shadows more blue toned to really offset that warmth in the highlights. This is something I discovered in the Shao E style study, and guys, it has literally changed my art forever. As you can see, this painting has some specular highlights, and that is kinda killing the Renaissance vibe. So what I'm gonna do is create a new layer, pick a highlight color from the skin, and softly airbrush it over the center of the face. Not only does this make the skin look perfect and baby soft, it also saves you a ton of blending time. Instead of trying to smooth out every tone in the painting itself, just create a semi-transparent filter on top of it. Problem solved. This isn't necessary, but it is a quick and dirty trick to instantly create that dramatic light effect. Remember how we talked about framing the character with shadows? We're basically going to darken everything but the character's face, and that will instantly create way more drama, while also causing your focus to drop smack dab in the middle of the painting right on her face. Besides, this is a cheap way to not have to paint background elements. I use this shamelessly. If it's in the shadow, you probably won't see it anyway, so just pretend that all your cool background elements are in the shadow. But remember, you did not hear this from me, okay? Just as long as we understand each other. <laughs> remember how I said that oil paintings catch the light in such a beautiful way that can't be replicated with digital art? That's because you're watching the light play off of the canvas itself. With digital art, however, you simply don't have that physical, third-dimensional aspect. But we can totally fake it with everyone's favourite part of Photoshop, and that is Color Dodge. Color Dodge Blending Mode lightens what's underneath it, but it also really saturates the transition area between the light and dark tones. 
For instance, here is me trying to do a value sphere with just a regular brush, and here I'm using Color Dodge. See how in the Color Dodge sphere, everything seems more vibrant? That's because it hasn't just lightened up the highlight area, it has also saturated the midtones. It is super easy to go overboard though, so make sure you use this sparingly, but you can fake that satin shine effect by picking up a highlight color and a soft airbrush set to color dodge mode and basically creating an artificial shine. This is a trick I learned from Hardy Fowler, as with pretty much everything else I've learned about digital art to be honest, but it works really nicely in this context and that is to use the Paint Daubs filter. Now, the later versions of Photoshop have a bunch of extra filters that are hidden from the filter menu, including the artistic filters. But if you go into Edit, Preferences and Plugins, here make sure you check the option called Show All Filter Gallery Groups and Names. Now when you look at the Filters drop-down menu, you should have a bunch of extra filters. If you look in the Artistic submenu, you'll find a thing called Paint Daubs. What this does is basically turn your pixels into paint spots based on the colours and such. Here's what it does to a regular photograph. With your painting, this filter basically takes your painting and puts it through a painterly filter. In essence, it gets rid of your digital brush strokes and creates new, more traditional looking brush strokes. You can play with the size and sharpness and it'll give you a much more painterly looking image. And finally, to tie it all up, we use the texturizer filter. Again, I think this is hidden in the... Hello? Hi! We just realized I was in the different room. Yeah. Come sit down. <laughs> and finally, to tie it all up, we use the texturizer filter. This adds a fake texture to your painting. I usually go with the canvas effect and it instantly makes my painting look like it was done on canvas and scanned in. Alternatively, you can find a canvas texture off the internet and place it on your image with a soft light blending mode, but I found that the texturizer filter is just way better in general. And there we go! Here's the original and here's the fake Renaissance painting. Pretty cool, huh? For the original painting today, I kind of wanted to focus on how any subject matter can be turned into a renaissance painting. So instead of picking a traditionally renaissance-y scene, I've kind of gone more eastern with it. So here's an Asian-inspired character painted in the style of the old masters, something you probably won't see too often.
type of video and I know it was quite long so thank you so much for sticking this far if you have. Comment below which other artists you want me to cover and I will add them to my ever growing list of style studies to do on this channel. Like this video, subscribe to my channel, come find me on social media, come say hi, I need new friends, everyone knows this. But with all of that said, thanks so much for hanging out with me today, I hope it's been fun and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye!